Today on the Potential Psychology Podcast. Hi, it's Ellen, host of the Potential Psychology Podcast, and we're back with new episodes, new ideas, some new practical and helpful tools for you to spark progress and unleash your potential. Listen in to find out what's in store. Welcome to the Potential Psychology Podcast. I'm your host, psychologist Ellen Jackson, and this is the show in which we explore what it is to be human and how we as humans can fulfill our potential. Happy New Year and welcome back to the Potential Psychology Podcast. I hope you are at least a little bit excited about the beginning of a new year. And I hope that the first month of that year has treated you well so far. I'm certainly excited about 2024. 2023 was a little challenging, not in any highly dramatic and life-altering kind of ways. Nothing bad happened. And in fact, a lot of really good stuff happened for me in 2023. I started a regular gig on ABC Radio Breakfasts with Steve Martin every second Wednesday, where we talk about psychological type topics, but very much in the vein of this podcast. I'll put a link in the show notes if you're interested in listening in every second Wednesday, Breakfast with Steve Martin on ABC Ballarat. I taught the Developing Leaders course in the Federation University MBA program for the second time, and that's a lot of fun. I learn a lot along with the students. My kids are happy and healthy. I got back into regular yoga. I've started writing again, a newsletter, which you can find on Substack. It's called The Messy Middle, and I'll put a link to the show notes in the show notes to that as well. And yet for all of those good things, it was a year of reassessment, of discomfort, of a bit of confusion, maybe frustration, I reckon maybe a bit of burnout. And regular listeners would know that it was also a year in which I published very few episodes of the podcast because life and all of its messy middleness, hence the name of the Substack newsletter, which I suspect might be a post-pandemic, if we are in fact post-pandemic transition adjustment situation that you might have experienced as well, it meant that I just didn't find the focus and the time that I needed for podcasting, which was a shame because I love it and I missed it. And there was something else, a little bit of play as well. After five years and 100 episodes, over 100 episodes, almost entirely interviews in human behaviour and human experience with experts, I felt that the potty needed a little bit of a refresh. Or maybe I needed a little bit of a refresh, I'm not sure. But I thought it was an opportunity to change things up a little. But it took me a long time to figure out what that refresh was going to look like. I had to be patient. I had to muddle through, even though that was uncomfortable. And I had to just wait for the ideas to form because such is the nature of any creative pursuit. You can't force it. And in fact, my word for 2023, before I even really knew what was ahead of me and all of that messy middleness, was unfurl. I knew, even though I didn't know what the outcome was going to be, that I was going to have to let the year unfurl and the podcast ideas unfurl, which seems kind of prescient now because that's exactly what happened. But now we are back. My word for 2024 is renewal. So we're back with a new format, not too different, but a little bit new. And we're exploring renewal and change and creating new behaviours and fulfilling our potential as individuals and as members of bigger systems, so work teams and organisations, but also families and communities. Because, and this is something that I've been exploring a bit recently, both personally and professionally, it's the systems that we function in day to day, these bigger kind of networks, these bigger concepts, these bigger groups that we operate in that have a huge influence on us when it comes to making changes, when it comes to achieving our goals, when it comes to being the best 
version of ourselves. And we all like to think that if we take a linear approach to solving problems and break them down and find a strategy or work our way through it step by step, this is how we've been taught to solve problems or achieve our goals, that that's pretty much all there is to it. And it doesn't matter if that's a challenge with our kids or our health or our family life or our work or our team or an organisation that we're leading or indeed a community initiative that we want to make progress on. We're often led to believe, and this is what you hear from the podcasts and the books and the experts, that if we take this step-by-step analytical linear reductionist approach to it, it's just a matter of going from step one to step eight, that we'll get the outcome we're looking for. And sometimes that will works. You know, sometimes we will, but often it won't. Sometimes the challenges or the situation we're trying to deal with is too complex for that linear, analytical, systematic approach. Sometimes we might change something somewhere or take a step or change a behaviour and it has these unexpected results somewhere else or we're thwarted in our efforts because something outside of that kind of linear goal setting progression has an impact on us and how we function and it means that that step makes us go sideways or backwards even. And sometimes there's there's small changes that we make that have much bigger impacts than we thought it would. And there are times where the problem or the challenge is just too big and multi-pronged and fast moving and this reductionist linear approach just doesn't work. The problems are complex. We can't apply a straightforward linear solution. And this is what's captured my attention and my imagination lately because it's really relevant in terms of teams and organisations where I do much of my work. They are complex systems, as we call them. But it's also really relevant in communities and in relation to social impact issues, which is where I've been increasingly exposed, I suppose, in the last couple of years, the sorts of things I've been exposed to. A challenge like the housing crisis, for example. If one person or one organisation or even one government knew how to find a solution to the housing crisis that we presently find ourselves in and that much of the world presently finds themselves in, I'm fairly confident that they would have done it by now. If it was a straightforward, we've just got to work our way through this 10-step process, we would have found a solution because it's not for lack of motivation. You know, people want to find it. There's a lot of people working really hard at trying to find a solution to this problem. And we might think that it's just people getting in our way and people trying to thwart, but but that's part of this complex system notion that there will be other people with different agendas or different ideas or even just different levels of expertise or different types of expertise who see the challenge differently. And if we don't take all of those pieces into account, it's really hard to make progress on some of these more complex issues. So, Politics aside, there's no lack of motivation to try and solve the housing crisis issue, but it is an issue that's complex. It's what we call wicked, a wicked problem. It has social and health and policy and industry and economic and community and individual elements to it that sometimes work as competing forces. So more complex problems require a more complex or just a different mindset, a different way of approaching them. And this is systems thinking. This is starting to see things as complex systems. So at an individual level, we are also shaped in many subtle, sometimes imperceptible ways by what's happening around us, by the systems that we operate in. And yet for so long, we have really neglected that context and its impact. We expect ourselves and each other to make changes in life or at work or at home through sheer force of individual will, to create healthy habits alone, independently, without taking into consideration the effects of our broader lives or the messaging that might shape how we think or feel about what we're trying to do. 
We expect ourselves to change practices or processes at work by implementing new workflows or procedures without considering the forces that might exist in your work environment that actually work against those new practices taking hold. We try to implement new family routines without considering that each individual in a family is constantly changing and growing and being influenced by what's happening in their systems, the worlds that they're operating in. So their workplace, their school, with their friends, in their inner world. And of course, when we try to make these changes in isolation of all of those other factors, we set ourselves up for failure. Often, not always, but often. The new change or the habit or the behaviour or the routine or the workflow might work well initially, but it's unsustainable because of these additional forces. Or the change that you make in one area might have unintended consequences in another area, like cutting back your work hours to reduce stress, but then finding that your reduced income leads to other possibly more uncomfortable forms of stress. So we are all complex systems ourselves, in and of ourselves, and we exist in a network of complex systems that have an impact on our experience and certainly have an impact on any change that we're trying to make in our lives. To quote John Donne, the poet, from 1624, so people have been wrapping their heads around this idea for quite some time, no man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, part of the main. Yet we rarely look at life that way. So that's what we're going to be exploring on the Potential Psychology Podcast in 2024, what we call systems thinking, this different way of looking at what it is we're seeking to change or attain in our lives, a better understanding of the interconnectedness of life, exploring a new way of seeing the world and its challenges, following our curiosity, looking for patterns, holding things lightly instead of with a white-knuckled grip, as some of our wonderful colleagues call it, testing new approaches and learning from them, having this very flexible and adaptable approach to the experiences that we're having and the goals that we're setting ourselves and the changes that we're trying to make in our lives, whether for personal reasons, for group or organisational reasons, or in fact for community or perhaps for the world. It's all about finding new and different ways to spark progress and unleash our potential. So how's it going to work? Well, And I'm experimenting with this as we go along because part of taking a systems approach is about experimentation and trying new things and seeing what works and what doesn't and listening to feedback and all of those sorts of elements that we'll explore a bit further. So this is all quite new for me too. I don't know. It's not linear. I haven't set myself a linear progression that we will work through to get us from point A to point B. We're exploring as we go. And we're going to start with shorter solo episodes, a little one like this one, just me sharing some of my learnings as a workplace psychologist, but also as a human being, and the things that I'm learning about this new way of viewing the world. Because as I said, to take a few true systems approach, that's the way we need to do it. We need to learn as we go. So I'm getting curious and I'm testing and learning and exploring, and we'll do this together collectively. It is about wonder and it's about a spirit of inquiry and a willingness to see where we end up. So in that vein, I will incorporate interviews with subject matter experts as we go along, because that's a great way to learn and very much the hallmark of this podcast. I'm also keen to share some practical tools with you. So there are some worksheets, there's homework. In fact, the First of those is ready for you right now. If you pop over to the Potential Psychology website, which is potential.com.au, you'll find a link to, or you can download the first worksheet. You'll also find a link to it in the show notes for this episode on your podcast player. And the first worksheet prompts you to think about the systems that you operate within So it's time for you to get a little bit curious and start to think about the systems that you operate in. And I'll guide you through that and we'll do a bit more of that in a moment. The new podcast episodes will be monthly. That's the aim. I'm aiming for the first of every month. And they are, of course, available wherever you listen to your podcasts. I'll also be sharing podcast episodes on Substack and some video on Substack. I think, I think that's what I'm doing. Not sure yet. (laughs) Wait and see. 
because we're creating a really lovely community over on Substack. It's where I am doing a bit of writing as well. So uh, you might like to listen in there or welcome if you are listening in there already. I will be expanding there on some of the same themes that we're covering in the podcast, but also writing some additional content, sometimes things that pique my interest, sometimes things that will be relevant to what we're talking about on the show. Uh, Sometimes just a bit of exploration of my own, because again, in the spirit of inquiry, it's what 2024 is going to be all about. Uh, So if you are already a subscriber to the Substack newsletter or the show, you'll get all of that content automatically. If you're not, I really encourage you to do so. So sign up at substack.com, search for The Messy Middle by Ellen Jackson, follow the link that's in the show notes, pop over to the website potential.com.au, lots of different ways to make sure that you're signed up to the content for 2024. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. But right now, I do have some homework for you if you're so inclined. So I want you to start thinking about the systems that you operate in and how they might interact and interrelate to each other and with each other. So this is really what we call a simple systems mapping exercise, really simple to get started. There is a worksheet to help guide you through. It is at potential.com.au. And it's really just an example of a mind map as a sample. It's a bit of a prompt and puts you at the center. So think of yourself as the center, the hub of like a hub and spoke model. And emanating from you are six key areas of life. They're the spokes on this wheel. Could be six, could be eight, could be a hundred. It really doesn't matter for this exercise. So I've just put together an example that's got six just to get you thinking. So Those six key areas in the example that I've given are family, social, community, health, financial, and work. Six systems that affect many of us. Again, just examples. So if we look at the work system, we have three sub areas that spring from there. Co-workers, tasks, and your work environment. Again, not a complete set, just three examples. So each of these three areas affect us in different ways and largely in ways that you can't control. So your tasks, for example, affect how you think, feel and operate. If you've got a lot of them, you might be feeling overwhelmed. If you're really interested in the tasks, you might be feeling really motivated. If you're really bored by the tasks, you might be feeling pretty disengaged. So the tasks, you may or may not have control over them. They will all have an impact on how you feel and how you function both at work and probably outside of work as well. How you feel about your tasks and how you interact with your tasks will probably also have an impact on your relationship with your colleagues or your co-workers. If you're feeling like you're shouldering too much of the burden, it might build a little bit of resentment. If you've got these wonderful colleagues who are forever trying to help you with stuff or guide you through stuff or take things from you to alleviate your load maybe, then you might have a more positive response to work as well. So all of these things are interconnected and interrelated. Similarly, your physical environment will have an impact on your relationship with work and how you go about your tasks and perhaps how you interact with your colleagues. So being in the office might be great for ideas and being able to collaborate and generate new approaches or whatever it might be. But might also come with a lot of interruptions and a lot of meeting and a feeling of reduced productivity. Being at home on the other hand, might feel like you can just nail all your tasks and get it all through, but you're doing it very much in isolation. You don't have that opportunity to collaborate and to interact with and bounce ideas around and also gain the energy that you get from interacting with other people. And sometimes that energy is a drain, sometimes it's a draining energy, and sometimes it's a kind of a spark energy. Again, it's all of these systems that you operate in that will have an impact on how you function, what you do, and then how you feel and all of these interconnected pieces. So there's probably going to be other elements. There will be other elements in your work system as well. So it could be your manager maybe and how you interact with the relationship you have with them. It could be senior leadership 
of your organisation, the decisions that they make, again, out of your control, but they have an impact on you, how you feel, how you function. Uh, Maybe legislation affects your tasks, so changes in legislation will change how things get done. Uh, Maybe you work in the health system, for example, and the season affects how busy you are or, you know, random things like pandemics will change the whole function and the operation of your system. So hopefully you can see where I'm going with this, that there's really no end to the different types of systems and you can, on your little mind map, add lines, scribble, link one thing to another, arrows, add, subtract, however you like. It's it's really, there's no right or wrong with any of this. There's no best way to do it. It's really just a prompt to get you thinking in terms of the systems that you operate and function within and the sort of impact that they have on you. Because once we've got a grasp of that, a better grasp of that, that really helps inform our decisions about how we might make the changes that we're looking to make. And there's some of the things that we'll work through in our next episode and beyond. So your task is to spend a few minutes drawing up your own systems map to get you thinking about these different systems that you operate in and how they interact with each other and how they interact with you and how they affect you. Do look for positive spirals as well. So an example of a positive spiral is if you think about the health domain, so that might be one of your systems on your map. If you think about your health map, regular exercise for a lot of us, helps us to sleep. And if we get better sleep, we generally have better moods or more manageable moods. And that then tends to improve our relationships and it might also help our dietary choices, for example. So that's all connected and it's a positive spiral. And of course that can work in the negative. So you don't get enough sleep or perhaps you don't exercise and it does impact your sleep and then it impacts your moods and then it impacts your relationships. And then it impacts some of the choices that you might make. So look for those spirals, but particularly look for the positive spirals because they're the ones that are a little harder for us to notice. We're very attuned to the negative things in life. We have to practice a little bit harder at looking for the positive things. Then next month, so this is just getting you ready for our next conversation, next month on the podcast, we will start to look at habits and building better habits from a systems thinking perspective to see if that can inform and assist and help you along perhaps some of the goals that you might have set yourself for 2024. That is next month on the Potential Psychology Podcast. I'm going to wrap it up here, but I'm really pleased that you're here. It's been so great chatting to you again. I've missed you. I'm excited about the new things that we're going to learn and explore together over the course of this year. If you're not already a subscriber to the show, please hit subscribe on your podcast player so that the next episode downloads straight into your feed. If you have feedback or comments or thoughts or ideas or questions, please let me know. You can connect with me via the website, which has had a little bit of an upgrade, new photos, a few little changes you might notice. That's at potential.com.au or on social media. So LinkedIn is great for me right now in particular, but also Substack or Instagram. And finally, I want to say how grateful I am to each and every one of you for tuning in and being a part of this community and the renewal of the Potential Psychology Podcast. It means the world to me. I love being able to share these insights and the things that I'm learning and connect with you. And I'm looking forward to doing more of that in 2024. So until next time, take care, go forth, spark progress and unleash your potential. Potential.